Hello, everyone. My name is Zach Deering, and I'm a business development representative here at Milk Specialties Global. And I will be your host today for the, our webinar on extruded protein with some market trends and formulation insights. Here at Milk Specialties, we have over 75 years of experience in the whey world. Our company was founded in 1944, but the real journey begins in 1976 when we started taking in that raw whey and transitioning that into calf milk replacer. Then in about 2008, we got into the human nutrition world with our Mountain Lake facility by taking in that raw whey and processing it into whey protein concentrates and isolates. Shortly after that, in 2009, we opened up a contract manufacturing facility in Watoma, Wisconsin, with the ability to take in our whey proteins, do custom blending and private labeling for a lot of the top sports nutrition brands. And with the expansion of a lot of our production facilities in 2014, we were able to become the single largest producer of whey protein in North America. And then we've had some other highlights that we're proud of most recently with the expansion of our NutriPro line, as well as our facility out in Visalia, California, doubling its lactose production. Here's a general overview of our facilities. Our human nutrition facilities are primarily producers of milk and whey proteins, um, while our animal nutrition are doing our calf milk replacer as well as our energy booster line. And then we also have our contract manufacturing service out in Watoma, Wisconsin, as well as our extrusion co-man out in Clara City, Minnesota. Here are a number of the core products that our company produces, as well as some other services we offer. Obviously, we got the milk and whey protein concentrates and isolates, and a number of specialty proteins that we offer within our core pro products. Then we also offer up our contract manufacturing facility, one being our Tomo, Wisconsin, which does custom blending and private labeling for ready to mix sports nutrition products, and then our extrusion facility, which I'll get into a little later. With our proteins, there's, there's a number of different applications that you can use, but here are a couple that we really like to highlight. We do a lot of work with our ready to mix for whey proteins and milk proteins, as well as our crisps. But we will also assist with kind of the functionality and applications for our proteins into a number of other items. So allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm Zach Deering. I'm a business development representative here at Milk Specialties. Been here for about four years. Um, done a lot of work just helping our customers come to us with an idea on anything they want to use with protein and just guiding them throughout our contract manufacturing services. Ted Chamberlain here will also be assisting me on this webinar, and he's the formulations and ingredient innovation manager. Ted has done a lot of work with our contract manufacturers, as well as just our milk and whey proteins for our research and development. So at the end, we will have a live question and answer with Ted and I. Um, all questions will be answered live at the end of the webinar, not in a written response. So just feel free to type any at any point throughout this presentation. Let's cover some of the historical development of extrusion technology, as well as the major components that go into the construction of an extruder, and then processing parameters and for formulation parameters that you can consider when trying to achieve a good quality product, depending on whatever your target is. So extrusion as a food technology is relatively young, especially when compared to some things like fermentation, which we know have been around for thousands of years. Even as late as the late 19th century, we hadn't really advanced beyond manually operated or hand cranked meat grinders, which were then used to extrude sausage into casings. And then uh, with the advent of electrification, that became a bit more advanced and industrialized at a larger scale, just because it was not bound by human power. And so uh, then later you get more advancements of the technology. In about the 1930s, we see single screw extrusion technology coming out, which was readily adapted to form pasta, as well as for pet food extrudates and dry cereal products, breakfast cereals. Uh, that technology was eventually superseded by the more complex and more versatile twin screw extrusion system. One of the key differences between these two was the twin screw extruders are self-wiping, 
Uh, when you have two screws operating together, they kind of clean each other off and help convey material more efficiently down the barrel. When you go back to the single screw extruders, they often had a rifled barrel, at least in the feed section, um, just due to the, the friction forces at play. You needed to create that barrel grooves uh, in order to get better friction, which then helps the extruder push the initial product down the tube. And then once you get that forward flow occurring, everything further down the barrel will move. And so that was one of the key advances in twin screw extrusion is that you get a better efficiency of conveyance through the barrel, which helps with uh, the uniformity of the residence time and the heating, kneading, shearing, all the things we'll discuss later on in terms of the parameters that go into forming the final extrudate. So that twin screw extrusion came about in about the 1960s. Over the next 20 years or so, really became the predominant uh, form of extrusion that was used for a lot of different food products just due to the versatility. These are also more complex machines. There's more maintenance costs, um, but due to the advantages, it just sort of took over. There's still use of single screw extruders, but they are a bit more limited. Um, and then the latest innovation within the subset of twin screw extrusion was high moisture extrusion, which came about in the late 1980s and rose throughout the 90s. And obviously now we're seeing the advent of a lot of high moisture plant-based meat analogs. Uh, those are typically made using a high moisture extrusion technology. Um, one of the earliest applications was to take a surimi or fish paste to make an imitation crab, lobster, or other shellfish. Now, obviously, we've advanced to doing all sorts of uh, beef, pork, chicken type, even fish uh, meat analogs with this technology. One notable difference between high moisture and low moisture extrusion is one, high moisture products obviously have an inherent risk of spoilage. So there's uh, associated downstream refrigeration or frozen processing and storage that's necessary, as well as the addition of a cooling die on the end of the extruder. So where you'd normally have a die plate and a cutting assembly, you add a uh, cooling die and then maybe your cutting assembly after that. The importance of that is that you have this hot molten mass with denatured proteins and starches and all these components in it. And so by cooling that product before it comes out of the extruder, you allow the proteins to all cross-link with each other and form a fibrous network, which is going to be what emulates that pulled pork or pulled chicken type of a texture for these meat analog products. So that's a very key difference. Also, just there's a lot of additional cost and maintenance with this more complex technology as well. So now let's get into the various components that go into an actual extruder. Um, we'll just start from the beginning with the feed and any upstream equipment. So oftentimes you will have upstream blenders or hoppers of various sizing according to the size of your extrusion system. So you may have a large dry fluidized paddle blender or ribbon blender, and then that may be fed either pneumatically or by gravity feed into a hopper directly above the preconditioner. And the preconditioner is essentially a small auger that has often water, steam, or oil injection ports on it. So you can do some preheating as well as an addition of a, at least a portion of the moisture that's going to go into the product before it comes out at the dye further downstream. Um, so that's just a way to incorporate that, do some prehydration of some of the starches or proteins. And then when it comes out of the, the preconditioner, that's often directly above the extruder barrel. So that's most often a gravity fed system. And then as it drops into the barrel from the preconditioner, um, that barrel section is where most of the work, um, literally work, <laughs> of the screws kneading and sometimes even milling when you have a larger mesh size or particulates in there. So that is where most of the magic, if you will, happens. So in the barrel, those are typically segmented and jacketed. So you have the ability to heat different sections of the barrel to different temperatures, depending on what it is you're trying to extrude and the characteristics you'd like to have there. Additionally, on the barrel, you'll often find steam water oil injection ports similar to how you would in a preconditioner. Um, so those can obviously be used for the addition of, uh, addition of moisture or oil. If you're making a product that has a higher oil content, you can do that in the barrel itself. Now in a twin screw extruder, obviously you have two screws and these can be either co-rotating, which means they rotate the same direction or counter-rotating, which means they rotate opposite direction. So here we have a picture of co-rotating screws. You can tell they're co-rotating screws because the flights, which are essentially the ridges on the outside of those screws are oriented in the same direction. So it's almost a continuous um, 
line between the two of them. And that's how they, they intermesh. These are intermeshing that's most common so that they have an efficient conveyance. And that's why you have the advantage over a single screw extruder. Now you also have counter rotational where they rotate in opposite directions. And those are notable, or you can tell that when those are counter rotating because they will essentially form an offset V shape where they will interlock, but the flights will be oriented in opposite directions. So it'll be a V pointing forward or backward, depending on if you're having forward or reverse conveying flights. Um, the screws themselves are often just a shaft that have modular sections on them. So you can have different components mounted on the screws. You can have forward and reverse conveying. You can have kneading paddles. There's also some more specialized uh, co components that can be used for various products. But the most often are various pitch or various angle of forward and reverse conveyance. Sometimes what you'll have is uh, you'll start with a very high angle, so very efficient forward conveyance, and then you'll see shorter or sharper and sharper angles. So you essentially get compression of the material as you reach closer to the die plate. And that's more common when you're trying to do a direct expanded product because you're really building up that pressure before you get to the die plate and the drop off in pressure from inside of the die plate to the outside is what causes that steam to flash off and you get that expansion. So speaking of getting to the die plate, uh, that is where the predominant shaping and sizing of an extrudate comes from is dependent on the size, shape, and quantity of the holes that are on the die the, on the die face itself. And then additionally, you have a cutting assembly most often on those. If you didn't have a cutting assembly, you'd end up making just infinite noodles of whatever your extruded product would be, which not to say that isn't desirable, but that's sometimes difficult to package. So you have here, you can see a picture of a die face and a cutting assembly on there. The number of blades can be variable. And then the run or the cutter speed, the rotational speed of the cutter can be variable as well, depending on the length of the pieces that you're trying to make. So a very short flat crisp option is going to have more blades or higher cutting speed as, as opposed to something that may be longer in uh, longitudinal length. One thing to note is that when you get the expansion from due to that drop off in pressure at the die face, you get both radial expansion. So if it comes out of a one millimeter diameter hole, it might expand to two millimeters in diameter. Um, and then eventually as it cools, there is some, at least on the surface, there's a little bit of shrinking, um, less so in, in the center of an extruded piece. And then also in addition to that radial expansion, you get longitudinal expansion. So if, the, if you have one millimeter that's come out of the extruder, it might expand out to two mil millimeters of protrusion. And so that's just one thing to consider. Uh, you can see that shrink as products cool. So if you're cutting it to a certain size and then it's cooling rapidly, uh, you may end up with something that's undersized. So it's something that obviously you can dial in your cutter speed to achieve the size and shape that you desire. And the dies themselves can be a diverse array of shapes. You could do umbrella, you could do smiley faces, you could do stars, triangles, circles, O's, obviously, if you see it like a typical serial loop shape, uh, very common. And so that is actually one of the more advantageous aspects of twin screw extrusion is that you get this greater variety of shapes that are possible. Um, one thing to consider is that more complex shapes often lose a bit of the resolution. So if you wanted to do a 12 pointed star, you're probably going to end up with roughly 12 lobes, but they're not going to be as pointed as possible. So the more complex the openings on the die are, the more loss you have in terms of what you may be expecting in terms of shape versus what you actually deliver on. So simple shapes such as a circle or an O are most often recommended. As I mentioned briefly before, you can have a cooling die attached to the end of the barrel for high moisture extrude date products. Not really the focus of our production or this webinar, so we won't spend too much time on that. Additional downstream equipment that you could have on an extrusion line may include a dryer for low moisture extrudate products just to drive off any residual moisture and lower your water activity to aid in the production of a shelf stable product. If you're making something like a cereal or a, a snack food that's going to end up as a packaged good, you may also have inline coating and packaging systems. Our facility, for example, does have coating and packaging capabilities downstream of our production. As far as parameters to consider to get you the proper finished good, 
Um, first and foremost in there is going to be your selection of your dry ingredients, as well as the moisture content of those ingredients and the moisture that you may add in line, as well as if you're going to be doing any oil injection. Really what you put in is what you're going to get out with the exception of some of the moisture that will flash off. So based on the nutritional targets for your end product, that's going to be really what determines what you're going to be using in raw materials. Obviously, the ingredients are going to carry through. So if you're, you know, your allergens will all carry through. Um, notably, extrusion is a fairly effective kill step. And so you can use non-ready to eat materials as an ingredient, and then they can come out the other end as a ready to eat product. So one of the advantages of extrusion cooking technology is when you're doing low moisture extrusion, for example, you're not heating up all that water. So it actually takes significantly less energy to achieve a cooking kill step as opposed to if you were going to say bake a chicken breast, just as an example. Uh, another thing that affects the characteristics of your extrudate product is the barrel residence time. You know, shorter barrel residence time obviously limits the degree of cooking that you can have, which can be good or bad, depending on what you're trying to do. Too long of a barrel residence time can have a negative effect as well. And so you adjust that most often by either the rotations per minute that you have for your screws, as well as your selection of the co components on the screws. So the amount of forward conveyance efficiency that you're building in with the selection of those components. Um, they, those components, as you choose, should, would also have a large impact on the amount of shear that's going to be imparted to the product as it progresses its way through the barrel. So for, say, a texturized vegetable protein, you're going to want a lot, high degree of shearing. You may add in kneading paddles in order to impart that. Um, those typical conveying flights that you saw on the previous slide, those are not necessarily going to be imparting a lot of shear. So you do see oftentimes the additional um, kneading sections throughout the barrel. Uh, the pressure that you build up as you get closer to the die face, that oftentimes is attributed at least in part to the compression ratio. So if you start with a very, um, very broad pitch and then those flights get closer together as you get down, that's gonna help build that pressure. And again, the pressure gradient between the inside of the barrel and the outside of the barrel at the die face, that's largely gonna determine the amount of the degree of heating you can achieve. Higher pressure allows higher temperature as the water can become superheated. And then so that then flashes off the steam. So the pressure has a large impact on the expansion of the product you're making as well. If you're making a texturized product, you don't necessarily want to build actually too much pressure. You want a high shear, but maybe lesser pressure so that you don't end up expanding that texturized product. Instead, you're going to get more of that fibrous texture that you're looking for in, a, say, a meat analog. Uh, temperature is important, obviously, especially if you're trying to achieve an expanded product. If you're not going to be above the boiling point of water, when you come out of the dye face, you're not going to see that flash of steam and you're not going to see that internal cell structure forming. Like when you have bread bake in the oven, you see that oven spring. That's essentially what's happening at a much more rapid pace when you have your extrudate product exiting the dye face. And then lastly, the dye opening, as we talked about a bit before, that's going to really be the predominant factor in shaping your extrudate product. So if you, know, if you want whatever shape, smiley face or something, that's going to be the shape that you have on your dye. And then sizing that, you typically see, especially with expanded products, you may have one centimeter in diameter. That's actually really big uh, in terms of a dye hole. But let's say you have maybe three millimeter hole. You're going to see that product expand to a multiple of that. Um, and then slow, slight contraction as well. So it's going to expand immediately at the dye face. And then as it cools, you'll see a small degree of shrink in terms of the radial diameter. And then obviously as you're cutting, you may see a longitudinal shrink as well, but that's typically a bit less pronounced. And then the quantity of the holes, um, essentially that just helps determine the total cross-sectional area of opening that you have on the die face. So the more openings you have, the larger cross-sectional area you have, the more outlet space you have for any pressure that you're building internally. So by limiting the amount of openings that allows you to build higher pressure, so then you may see a larger expansion ratio when something comes out. Obviously the inverse is true as well. If you have too much cross-sectional area and you're not feeding at the, an adequate feed rate or not having your screws uh, running at a high enough rotational rate or your conveyance is not efficient, you may not be building the pressure that's necessary to create the extruded product, especially with the expanded product that you're hoping to see. And so lastly, 
we can get into some parameters of the formulation that you need to consider as you're working on extruded products. So we'll start with the carbohydrate components. First and foremost is starch. Starch is very effective at aiding in expansion. So that's why so many cereals are obviously have a starchy base. They expand very well. And so if you're making a texturized pr uh, product, such as textured protein, low starch content is going to be beneficial. Oftentimes, if you're trying to make a Cheeto cheese puff or something made of cornstarch, you're going to see a much higher expansion rate on that product. So lower bulk density and typically a larger internal cell structure, or at least a typical larger internal volume of air, thus resulting in the lower bulk density. Uh, sugar is a tricky one because you don't want to go too high. You can see some fouling as well as some browning effects, especially when you have sugar in the presence of proteins. And so at low inclusion rates, sugar actually helps with the internal rheology of the plasticized mass within the extruder barrel. And so a, a slow addition of sugar can actually help to ha have that product flow a little better internally. And so you have a little bit less friction, you have less torque on the, on the motor that's turning the screws and you have a little bit less, um, less pressure buildup. And also then as a result of that, you have slightly less expansion. So over expanded products, Sometimes you can add sugar in, it helps to control that expansion. It's obviously very sugar functional in all sorts of applications in food. And that's why you see a lot of sugared cereals in addition to the flavor, they do help with sort of the uniformity of the pore structure on the surface of your extruded as well as the internal cell structure. Uh, fiber is a tricky one as well. Fibers are a little less functional in extrusion as opposed to starch or sugar or even proteins. Um, one thing to consider with them is that they do often make your ex final extruded product a bit harder. So you need to be careful with both the type of fibers you're using, as well as the inclusion rates. If you go too high, if you get too hard of a product, if you go too low, then you're not going to see the nutritional fortification that you may be looking for. So that's one that just obviously needs to be balanced with some of the other components, which is generally true of everything with extrusion. They're very tricky beast. So you have to dial these all in. It's a lot of trial and error or looking back on previous production that you've done. Uh, protein is obviously in the functional food space or in texturized proteins. It's very important. Uh, general rule of thumb with protein is that as your protein content goes higher, your run rate in terms of the pounds per hour that you can run through a nominal sized extruder will go down as well as the protein will help to limit that expansion. So the protein forms that that structure, sort of the network, kind of like a gluten network in bread, keep going back to that metaphor, um, but protein has that structure. And so the more protein you have in there, the more cross-linking you can have. And then the more cross-linking you have, the more they're going to resist the expansion as you have the steam flashing off of the dye plate. So protein and starch are often inversely related to each other. And so you need to balance any amount of starch addition you have with the protein in there to achieve the right level of expansion in the product. Um, salt can also be very functional. In addition to providing flavor, you can sometimes affect the color and the end function, maybe hi improving hydration ratios in a texturized protein with the addition of salts. So ta uh, generic table salt is helpful. It functions actually much the same way to sugar in terms of helping with the internal rheology when you're in the barrel. So salt can be added to help reduce the expansion if you're making a slightly overexpanded product, a low degree of inclusion, usually less than 2%, sometimes significantly lower than that, can help with some of the properties you see in the extruded product. Additionally, carbonate salts can be helpful. They help with um, generating carbon dioxide, similar to how yeast is generating carbon dioxide to help bread rise. You basically are building that carbon dioxide into your blended product. And then when you come out the end of the extruder, when you have the steam flash off, you also see a lot of the carbon dioxide flash off and that helps to build sort of that uniform internal cell structure that gives you that airy texture that you're looking for in a lot of expanded products. Additionally, if you're gonna be adding a salt to your blend that will affect the pH, that can then also have an effect on the amount of browning that you see either as the product is coming out of the extruder at the dye phase or downstream processing. If you're gonna be drying, um, a pH obviously has an impact on the Maillard brown reactions. And finally, the fat content and type in your, in your extruded formulation is going to have an impact on multiple things. Obviously flavor, mouthfeel in whatever the finished product, fat's very important for that. 
fat typically also will limit expansion. It starts to sort of lubricate the plasticized mass within the barrel. And so you see a lesser degree of work being imparted to the dry materials. And so again, you see a lower pressure, lower expansion ratio coming out at the end of the dye with higher fat content. Most often you wanna remain under about 5%. You may have some leeway to go a bit higher, but typically lower is better, especially if you're trying to make an actually expanded product. And then finally, the types of fats, um, whether that's saturated or unsaturated, can have an impact both on um, the shelf stability of the product. Obviously, saturated fats will have a longer shelf life than unsaturated fats, less prone to oxidation and decomposition in that manner, as well as uh, saturated fat will be more likely to be solid at room temperature. And so you may have some texture impact when you have an unsaturated versus a saturated fat in your product. And so now I'll hand it back off to Zach to talk a bit more about extruded snack offering. Thank you, Ted. Next, I'll be discussing some extruded snack market trends. With extruded snacks, we are expected to see a 7.4% increase in the compound annual growth rate over the next years. This is due to a number of things. One in particular is that younger generations are switching away from home cooked meals and really just looking for healthy on the go alternative snacks. With that, they have increased disposable income, so they don't mind spending the extra dollar to get that healthy alternative versus taking the time to cook at home. These consumers happen to be very health conscious, so they're really understanding the macronutrients on the label and the ingredients actually going in the extruded snacks. With kind of this overlay, we are, we are seeing a lot of expansion into the European and Asian markets. Primarily, these products have been wheat-based in the past. However, we are seeing an, a large increase in demand for potato-based products. So like the veggie garden straws here are potato-based extruded snack, where the corn and wheat have kind of just maintained its demand over the past couple of years. Within these, within these large extruded snack companies, we're seeing a lot of the big brands get introduced to them. You got General Mills, Pepsi, Nestle, Kel Kellogg, Calbee, Kraft. You got a number of them really entering this extruded snack market. And within the past couple of years, we've seen a couple of big plays by these companies like Pepsi taking over Bear Snacks and Calbee taking over Warnock Foods. So with extruded products, we have also seen an increase in the textured protein market. And we're, in fact, we're expecting to see a 2.2 increase in the compound annual growth rate over the next nine years. This is due to a lot of consumers are switching to a plant-based protein or finding another alternative within their diet. Um, soy protein is typically hold, held the crown for this textured protein market. However, we are seeing a lot of new inclusions such as pea, rice, fava bean, lentil, corn, and a lot of other new innovative ingredients. Within this market, we are seeing just consumers understanding what they're putting in their body. They know the ingredients that work well within their diet, um, as well as just an increase in the vegan population. A lot of the top sports nutrition brands have also transitioned into a couple of plant-based products, whether that be a bar, a ready to mix, or a ready to drink. Within this texture protein market, there's been a lot of price fluctuation in the ingredients, which is why we've seen some new introductions of different textured proteins, as well as there's some skepticism and uh, over the credibility of the product efficiency of what we're putting in our body. However, we, with, with that, we are seeing some opportunity because these consumers are looking for a lot cleaner labels as well as just looking for new protein sources. Because once they find something they like, they, they will stick to it and it'll suit their diet as best as possible. We've seen a lot of the same large brands get into the textured protein market, similar ones like Kellogg, General Mills, um, and then a couple other new ones like Roquette, ADM, Bene, uh, Denisco. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've seen a couple Companies make some big moves with Cargill, uh, working with Pierce uh, Food Investment and Ro Roquette and Beyond Meat becoming partners in 2020. With textured proteins, we typically see them in a number of different fashions. Um, they can be high, high moisture, low moisture. Um, a lot of the common ingredients, what I listed before, while soy dominates the 
majority of the market, we will see some wheat, pea, rice, uh, fava bean, things along those lines, typically in a lot of different shapes and sizes, but the chunks, slices, and flakes are the most common. And with that, most of these are typically used as like meat replacers, or often you'll see them in kind of like nutritional bars, baked goods, maybe some salad crumbles, anything along those lines are the most common. There's a, been a little bit of use in cosmetics as well as agriculture, um, but the primary use has pretty much been in meat replacers. So with extruded snacks, as well as textured proteins, both of those can be used as nutritional bar inclusions. So over the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of growth in weight loss bars, snack bars, and nutritional bars. As you can see on the right here, we have the Slim Fast Bar, the Kind Bar, and the Nature Valley Bar, all of which could be using um, in an extruded in inclusion. Um, on the left here, you can see that snack bars are kind of holding the title at 35%, while nutritional bars are close behind um, within this market share. And this is due to a number of reasons, just from consumers are shopping a lot online lately, and having bars in their cart and just a long lasting on the go and quick snack is really nice for them to have. Within these consumers, we've seen two out of three purchase a bar every single month, and then Post COVID within these bars, we've seen that over 30% of the new products have contained an inclusion, whether that be a nut, oat, or an extruded snack. Here are a couple other examples of some nutritional bars. You got the Abbott Nutrition, uh, 15 grams of protein zone perfect, uh, the Power Bar, which is containing 20 grams of protein, and then the GNC uh, Lean Bar. Very similar to a number of the other categories, but we have some key players with Nestle, Glambia, Premier, Kellogg, General Mills, GNC, Abbott. Um, and within this past couple of years of nutritional bars, uh, we've seen Nestle launch its own pea protein bar, as well as RX uh, launching their own plant-based protein bar. So with the extruded protein and snacks that I've touched on earlier, I would like to specifically touch on the Asian market trends. So we've seen the Asian Pacific extruded snacks market have a net worth of 8.2 billion in 2021. And we are expecting to see this grow with a compound annual growth rate of 4.6% um, to reach 10.28 billion by 2026. And this is due to a number of reasons like the rising urbanization within the Asian market, as well as similar things that I've discussed with the other market trends of consumers looking for on the go, healthy snacks, having a little more disposable income and being able to find that alternative that still meets all their nutritional claims, as well as we're seeing increased work hours, which makes it difficult to eat kind of that balanced diet where you could have a extruded snack on the go that could still sustain you. So this is creating a, a higher demand for kind of those ready to eat products that these consumers so desperately need. Same thing with uh, a lot of the other markets I've touched on, but we have a lot of the key players like Frito-Lay, um, Kellogg, Old Dutch, Nestle. Um, a lot of the big players are starting to move towards this market just due to the growth associated with it. On to touching on some extruded protein applications. Here we have a couple examples of products in the market from snacks to cereals to meatless crumbles to protein croutons and some cookies. And these are just a number of applications that can be used with extruded products. The big ones we touched on before, bar inclusions, and just any kind of rhyme or reason to find a healthy alternative substitute to their current diet. Um, one that I haven't touched on yet would be pretzels, but a lot of these other ones are very typical applications of extruded products. At Milk Specialties, we have the capability to customize any of these protein crisps. And here we have a couple examples. The first one being protein cereal. Um, I, we have just proven that with whey and milk protein and as well as plant protein, it works up to a certain percentage. And we'd be able to offer kind of custom seasoning and flavoring options 
shapes and sizes, as well as different packaging options. Um, and this is just a typical panel of one of our plant-based cereals that had been offered. Another big one that we touched on in the market trends would be the textured vegetable protein, which is typically used as a meat analog or meat extender um, with the capability of going up to 90% protein. Seen a lot of interest with the soy, rice, hemp, pea, a lot of the new ones coming into the market um, to represent this meat analog or extender. Also, we have the protein pretzels, which have been successful up to about 40% protein, similar to the cereal. We'd be able to offer some custom seasoning as well as a number of different shapes. Um, and this just happens to be one of our plant-based protein pretzel uh, nutritional facts. Next, I'll be taking you through some of our extrusion capabilities here at Milk Specialties Global. At our Clara City facility, which is located directly two hours west of the Twin Cities area, we have a 96,000 square foot facility containing a couple extrusion lines as well as a pretzel line. At this facility, we'd have the capability to do some coating as well as some packaging. At the facility, there's an on-site QA lab, but we also have the flexibility to send out for third-party testing if needed. At Clara City, we would be able to produce a number of different extruded and texturized proteins, similar to the ones that I've shown previously, whether that be a crisp, a ball, uh, a O, anything along those lines, using whey, milk, or any other vegetable protein. At this facility, we have a number of expert R&D formulation scientists, as well as some people capable of reverse engineering any um, current nutrition facts panel or ingredient statement and the ability to take that information and reverse engineer it into something that we can produce at our facility. We also ha just have the capability to take something from an idea all the way through an extruded, coated, packaged, finished good that you would see in the store all under one roof. And this is extremely beneficial because milk specialties is vertically integrated with their whey and milk protein supply chain. So if you were to use a, a whey or milk protein as one of your primary ingredients in your extruded product, um, it's extremely beneficial because we have that supply chain secure. Here's just kind of a little chart of us showing that we have really solid raw material and packaging um, connections as well as our own protein supply and just the ability to take something from an idea all the way to a finished good out on the market. At the facility, we have a number of different packaging options that I'd like to highlight. Typically, a lot of things are done in bulk, just in big two, 300 pound bulk boxes, but we would have the capability to kind of put that a little smaller in like a 15 to 25 pound bag as well as kind of the finished good um, sachets and cereal boxes. Those typically range from one ounce to like five or six ounces, as well as cereal boxes being typically eight to 10 ounces. For a lot of productions, we've seen typical lead time of 10 to 14 weeks. And just some more value added services with the facility um, being gluten free, kosher dairy, peanut free, the flexibility to kind of really take into what your idea is and create that final finish good for your team. Um, we also offer some trial services as well as some R&D flavoring capabilities um, as well as a warehouse. Lastly, I'd like to touch on our Milk Specialties Protex line. Protex is gonna be a highly customizable um, wardrobe of extruded high protein products to where our formulations team could partner with your team and discuss any kind of alterations for the ideal shape, size, texture, ingredient, or anything along those lines, or even reverse engineer your current formula. With Protex, there's gonna be protein fortification up to 90%, a lot of flexibility in the actual source of protein, 
as well as offering some color and flavoring op and options and the certifications that I previously mentioned. With Protex, you can see we have a number of available shapes and sizes already. Uh, the textured vegetable protein, the puffs, the pretzel twist, uh, the pillow puffs are a really cool one because they're actually injected um, material in the middle of those. Um, and then like your standard rice crisps um, as inclusions and pretzel sticks and chips. So with that, um, I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And I guess we'll take it to some Q&A. Thank you.